In today's episode, I want to just reflect a little bit on some of the disciples of Jesus and who they were, uh, how they related to Jesus, and also how we relate to them. Stay tuned. Hello friends, Pastor Tim Westermeyer here, Senior Pastor of St. Philip the Deacon in the western suburbs of Minneapolis. Good to be with you as always. A little inside baseball here. We were actually planning just to do a single episode this week and um, the, our videographer and editor and producer of these, Tim, who's behind the camera, um, say hi Tim. <laughs> hi. hi. And I got into a conversation that was sort of a continuation of a conversation we had after the episode, I believe that was teeing up our Lenten series here, uh, based on a book by Adam Hamilton, 24 Hours That Changed the World. And that starts with the Last Supper and Judas's betrayal of Jesus. And so a couple weeks ago, we were chatting about Judas and different sort of interpretations of what motivated him. And uh, maybe that's the subject for another episode, but just today, uh, Tim said, you know, is it understood sort of that all the disciples were kind of different, that they had different personalities? Um, and I, we had a nice conversation. So just very briefly, I would say the answer to that question is uh, yes, absolutely. And I've said this in other places, but I think one of the mistakes we make uh, when we read the Bible, uh, maybe in a way that's less deep or less thoughtful, is we presume, let's take the case of the disciples, that the language I would use is that they're not full-bodied, you know, three-dimensional human characters, but it, but we sort of collapse them into caricatures or cardboard cutouts. And when we do that, uh, it's not only hard, I would say it's impossible for us to relate to them. When we actually read the stories of the Bible with a little bit of uh, intentionality, a little thought, maybe with the help of some commentators and so forth, we start to get behind the stories and figure out, well, what's motivating these characters and realize that in these stories are actual uh, three-dimensional human beings who have a whole lot more in common with us than that separates us. Not to say there aren't distinctive things culturally and that separate us in time and so forth. So just real quickly on, on kind of a high-level blush or first, first blush, um, in terms of the disciples, I think of Peter, Clearly, uh, the, maybe the most senior, the most uh, respected disciple, but by no means perfect. Um, a, little, a little emotional, a little prone to quick action. What I said to Tim a minute ago is he's, he's less of a scalpel and more of a dull axe, maybe, is the appropriate metaphor. Um, again, none of these people were perfect, which is one of the reasons we can relate to them, because none of us are perfect either. Uh, but there's no question, you know, Jesus said to him, you are Peter, you are the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. So uh, clearly sort of the first among equals. Uh, then you've got Peter, James, and John who are sort of considered in some ways the insiders among even the 12 disciples. Um, you've got John who's, uh, you know, kind of a little more thoughtful, a little more pensive, a little younger. He sits next to Jesus at the Last Supper in a position of honor. He's referred to as the disciple Jesus loved. He's one of the disciples who's at the tomb first uh, after the resurrection. He's also, and we've talked about this before, the only male disciple who's there at the foot of the cross with the women. So that, that's a little bit about John. I think of Matthew, the tax collector. So we can probably infer from that that he was probably somewhat practical, uh, good with numbers, maybe not liked. Uh, by people of his time, maybe a little surprised that Jesus would choose someone like that to be one of his core followers. Thomas, uh, you know, maybe unfairly is, is gets the epithet of doubting Thomas because of the famous story about show me the wounds and, and then I'll believe. Um, but, you know, that certainly lends to uh, a reading of Thomas in which we want to sort of suggest or think. And this may be a little bit of a imposing our own worldview on him, that he's the sort of most scientific or rational among the disciples. Maybe that's fair, maybe it's not. And then, of course, Judas himself, and I, I mentioned on the front end of this, um, Judas obviously uh, gets sort of a negative rap because he's the one who uh, turns Jesus in, who betrays Jesus. But as I've said in other places, don't forget that Peter um, 
denies Jesus, and don't forget that all the other disciples, save for John, abandon Jesus. So it's not like any of them held up well under the stress or the pressure of that 24 hours that we're talking about this Lent. Um, and it, it maybe again, a subject for another episode, there are, uh, let's call them more sympathetic readings of Judas, which I think are legitimate to consider and explore. Doesn't mean any one of those is the answer, but it's interesting to reflect on those as we think about, again, how do those disciples relate to us and how do we relate to them. Maybe in bringing this to a close, I, I'll ask the question, given what you know about the disciples, um, is there one uh, that you resonate with the most? Is there one, most? Is there one that you identify with the most and, and why? That's one question. And I'd love for, uh, to for comments below about that question. The other might be, um, and this again was suggested by Tim, um, if we were to do a little bit of a deeper dive on maybe a handful, maybe not all 12 of them, but some of the disciples and explore who, who they were in relation to Jesus and what they did afterwards and so forth, is that something that would interest you? If it is, again, let us know in the comments uh, below. Um, that's it for today. As always, thanks for your time. Be well, stay in touch, and God bless. Mm -hmm.